Thank you very much, Agnes. And um, before I begin, I want to say thank you warmly. I'm uh, very happy to be back for the third time in Cluj, actually. I'm uh, honored to be here, uh, invited here. And um, thank you for this um, opportunity to come. Your colleagues around here, all the students, all the people that makes this uh, possible. It's been a great conference um, already. So uh, I have to say that uh, when I was finished and basically in Cluj, it struck me suddenly that I was going to a film and media conference and I don't have any moving images. I'm not going to talk about film. I'm going to talk about um, anything but film a little bit. But uh, let's see how it goes. Uh, and it was not meant to be provocative or rude. That was how it turned out. I took quite seriously, actually, the invitation to think about effective intermediality. That's what I really want to try to think about and talk about. So that was uh, steered my choice of uh, material more than uh, uh, the obvious choices. So, intermediate studies has the potential to, to, to suggest approaches to societal changes, as well as doing what intermediate has, studies has done for the last say 20 years, namely offering new or deepened ways to describe and analyze aesthetic phenomena. This gen general approach to intermediality and multimodality is important in our work in Victory and it lies behind the collective introductory book that came out a few years ago and that you showed already. I just wanted to do a little bit of marketing once again for this. It's open access on, online. Please uh, take a look if you, if you want to. But Intermediate studies, um, yeah, so in this book we try to uh, gather our insights uh, collectively in Vexu and to operationalize our terminologies on a wide fan of media types and phenomena, not, not only the arts. But intermediality, intermediality needs to be challenged and rethought, developed. And Agnes Petos conferences and research programs are always pushing intermediate agendas into new territories, which in this case is the new and a fascinating topic, effective intermedialities. So in my paper, I will explore the topic of effective intermedialities while also trying to connect to one of the crucial challenges of our time, also what you mentioned, the climate ecological emergency. And uh, what I'm going to do then, I'm going to talk about uh, Marcel Proust first. Did I lose my... Uh, no? Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about, begin with Marcel Proust, French author. Then I go to a Danish uh, author, uh, Amelia Smith. And then I move, uh, take a kind of a different directions, talking about two uh, explicit uh, climate change representations, namely the IPCC report, part of the IPCC report, and then a graphic novel to end, and then a few short remarks. Um, all the time I will try to circle around the question of how uh, one understanding of effectivity and intermediality may have something to do with subjectivity. That's going to be uh, my, core, my chorus during this. So I'll begin then in uh, Marcel Proust. Uh, an old mm, love of mine, you could say. And I'll begin in a very, very specific scene, quite a famous scene, if you're a Proustian reader, uh, namely the church tower or Matanville scene, so, um, which I have a children's uh, illustration of here. You'll see in a moment perhaps why. So I want to set the scene of a very particular scene in the first part of the book, where the young Marcel which is the name of the protagonist of Marcel Proust's novel, where the young Marcel is riding in a horse carriage on the countryside in France. In the fiction, it's about 1880. To his surprise, to this boy's surprise, he experiences two church towers that seem to move and change places when the carriage moves forward, and a third church tower that, taking, that takes a new position. It is, in a sense, a sim simple visual effect of the change of position, creating new and exciting perspectives. So initially, uh, the scene is described rather briefly. Uh, we hear about an intense pleasure unlike anything else that fills him. Un plaisir spécial, 
um, unlike anything else, a special pleasure resembling nothing else, which is a little bit strange because, I mean, he's just kind of seeing these church towers, right, moving. Um, then we learn that is, it is actually the movement that makes him having this uh, intense uh, pleasure. And it creates in him this uh, sort of in sort of divress, a sort of intoxication, perhaps we could say. Uh, but then afterwards we get, of course, a real uh, reason for this uh, in, intense pleasure, namely that he has this feeling that behind the church towers, the moving church towers, is something like a une jolie phrase. Uh, behind these church towers is something hiding, namely something that he could write down. It is a possibility for him to write uh, this Shuli phrase that makes him happy. The, so the joy of artistic creation. Immediately after we read, we read about this experience, we read it in the new version, the version that he supposedly wrote down on this uh, carriage, uh, slightly more elevated, slightly more literary. And then in the larger architecture of uh, Marcel Proust, a la recherche du temps perdu, which is more than 3,000 pages, then we have to wait 2,000 pages until this text turns up again, and then it turns out to be his first published article that he has been longing for, basically for 25 years or something. Um, so this is, in a sense, in, in, the, in the novel, this is supposed to be the first creative output of, of Marcel, so it's very, very important in the novel. So this is indeed an intermedial scene, if we stay a little bit in the intermedial. So we have the intramedial transposition from an experience in the so-called real world that turns into an aesthetic experience. And then this is doubled in the same novel into artful literary writing. And in, in this writing, there would be plenty of literary and artistic uh, references and art architectural descriptions. Now, to complicate things further, Marcel Proust, before he even started writing A la recherche du temps perdu, he actually published a newspaper article uh, called Impression de route en automobile, in, uh, impressions from a car ride, you could say, in Le Figaro. And this is a wonderful image, of course, of uh, Marcel Proust in the car with his beloved um, driver, Albert August Agostinelli. So this is from 1907 and in Le Figaro, a real article lying behind, you could say, some of the fictical stuff, fictional stuff. And diving into archives and media history, the Swedish literary scholar Sora Donius, she has, she has demonstrated that the church tower scene that I referred to in the beginning is not so much the story of the young genius having his first uh, literary epiphany, it is really about the much older Marcel Proust, the real Marcel Proust, I have to stress that, who discovers how rural France looks like when he drives in an automobile. So Rodonius uh, repeatedly stresses that Proust's description of epiphanic inspirations is less about Madeleine cakes or the mysteries of in involuntary memory or life or love or art. It's more about techn technology and media, be it, and then I have a little potpourri here, be it uh, Marais' uh, chronophotography, the new perception produced in early cinema, or the so-called theatrophones, or then automobiles, right? Proust originating newspaper article teaches us a lot, I think, about how Proust constructs his novel and it shows us that we need theories of mediation and subjectivity and technology to understand what lies behind his well-known ideas about art or memory. In the newspaper article that we saw before, uh, we meet Proust's intense fascination with Ruskin and Wagner and architecture and images and um, mythology, etc., etc. His Prose is elegant, or perhaps a little bit, uh, you know, baroque in its uh, overwhelming uh, intensity, but it is uh, nevertheless uh, intermediate literary prose. And while reading such a passage, 
the non-mediated the non-mediated reality of the world outside art and representational technologies gets smaller and smaller and smaller almost to diminish is this a realist description of, of, of a car ride in France or is it rather a mix of media references and media transformations scaffolded upon a minute mundane event. And the truth is probably that this is a, the wrong way to ask, or to pose the question. The question is not meaningful. Mediations are the only way we can access reality. What is characteristic for Post's way of constructing his scene here then is that he wants to hide all his inspirations for this. He wants to hide all the art references, almost all, and the technological and medial uh, references. Instead of Ruskin and Wagner and automobiles, there is a simple horse carriage, a simple change of perspectives, and then this mir mir miraculous literary creation. The techno and media sources behind the literary scene offers an intermediate insight, namely that literature, like all art, and all communication, perhaps, is per definition deeply embedded in and conditioned by technological and media infrastructures. Effective intermediality, as I will experiment with the term here, denotes uh, then an understanding of media and subjectivity and effect, which is not so much about subjective and personal registers or Im embodied feelings, emotions. And I should say, I've heard many brilliant uh, discussions of the term effective intermediality. I'm, I'm not able to take it in here. Now I just stick to my manuscript, right? But I heard many really interesting and good descriptions. I'm, I'm trying my way through this and then we'll see how it, how it goes. So, affectivity, as I want to use the term here, is, is about how living entities in the world, including human beings, live and act and connect. Now, German philosopher and media theoretician Erich Hörl has tried to characterize a general ecology in, the, in, the, in this book, then. In the very, very dense and long introduction to the book, Erich Hörl offers a wide-ranging wide discussion of how contemporary politics, aesthetics, and philosophy have to take into consideration a sort of post-anthropocentric and holistic description of the subjectivity, nature, culture interrelation. Media and technology are crucial elements in this discussion, and Hörl attempts to find a limited but nevertheless significant space for human subjectivity. A subject position opening a possible agency for critical and political interventions. In particular, Hurl wants to propose a theory which is not totally predetermined pre 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 by technological inventions or economic constraints. So that lies behind this kind of very abstract theoretization. Hurl's work, I think, relates to another contemporary media thinker, namely philosopher Mark B. N. Hansen, who rethinks early 20th century philosopher uh, Alfred North Whitehead's process philosophy in relation to media, technology, and subjectivity, once again, to reach what he calls an environmental subjectivity. Environmental subjectivity. Hansen's book, Feed Forward, is to a certain extent one extended exegesis and recontextualization of Whitehead into a contemporary media context. And the declared aim is to establish contemporary phenomenology, a contemporary phenomenology that paves the way for a produ productive understanding of subjectivity. So Hurl and Hansen developed their theoretical framework as a response to technological developments that threatens to dramatically diminish human agency. Both find that the blend between immersive and invasive technological mass media and commercial interest has threatening future perspectives. Hansen's and Hurl's response is to rethink and thus salvage human subjectivity and agency without retreating to an outmoded humanistic vis vision of an autonomous human subject, a subject that develops 
independently in an idealistic building of conscious choices in some transparent environments. Pearl and Hansen, and here I take my third inspiration in a sense, uh, namely Nikolai Lübecker. Um, so this is a recent study on, uh, on um, 21st century symbolism, as it's called, it's about Melamia, Valen, and Baudelaire. But he has, um, uh, they, these three are all interested in, in affectivity, and they refer to and discuss several of the, many of the names that we have, uh, been, uh, has been mentioned at this conference too. But they would theorize affectivity not so much as how text or media express or produce effects or feelings in the reader or by themselves. Affectivity such as Lübecker constructed via his reading of Simon Don is understood as a general processual ontology where technomedia and social conditions and nature together is considered to be the environment that affects human subjectivity. So Proust à la recherche du temps perdu, seen from such a perspective, is not only about an individual's way to become a writer, which is how we no would normally paraphrase the, th the 3,000 pages. It's not, about, it's not only about French society about, around uh, the, the Belle Epoque or anything else in that sense. Instead, we can read the novel as a text that demonstrates how Proust, as well as the uh, I of the moi of the text, is in a constant process of becoming with his environments. The novel can be read as a portrait of an uneven, non-logical and conflictual process of becoming that takes place in an intricate, unavoidable relation with the environments around both Proust and his protagonist and the other persons, without which they would not really exist. Eve kosovsky Setwick has argued in this direction also when she discusses Proust in a posthumous book, uh, Weather in Proust, The Weather in Proust. She's interested in remarks where the protagonist describes himself as a living barometer, a barometer, whatever you call it, thus being affected of pressures and weathers and surroundings in a semi-mechanical, semi or should we say, I would say, <laughs> affective in the intermediate way. It would, in a larger project, be productive, I think, to see how much a post and his narrator and the, and the persons in the book produce images and forms of connectivity and correlatedness. The representation, the representation of how the I and Marcel Post is necessarily implicated by media and technologies in order to live and act and receive new, exciting versions of the world and how man-made and so-called natural non-human entities seem to be endowed with different forms of agency. But now let me go on to um, my next jump in this. And here just, uh, without any considerations, jump 100 years to this Danish author, one of the most remarkable Danish uh, contemporary authors. Um, I'm going to talk about this book, uh, Thread Ripper, which is translated uh, recently into uh, English also, which I consider to be an intermediate depiction of Anthropocene Scandinavian life. The novel, I find, is an excellent description of some aspects of life in an unprecedented, unprecedented era where new questions and new forms must be explored and employed. So, the Anthropocene is often understood as a concept that defines a human-induced climate ecological crisis, as you will know. And the term has powerfully, I think, collected several natural scientific diagnoses under its wings as a cautionary or activist concept. However, the Anthropocene concept has consequences beyond the activist potentials. A host of commentators has stressed, and this includes Donna Haraway, or Bruno Latour, or Roger Bardotti, and many others, that the Anthropocene denotes actually the breakdown of clear boundaries between cultural history and natural history. Human subjects in the form of economically recognizable groups, mainly in the western, uh, west and the north, 
of the planet turn into geological agents, geological agents. And geology and what we thought was untouched nature turns out to be have human and subjective traits. The Anthropocene as a radicalizing philosophical concept lies behind, I would argue, both Lübeck's and Hansen and Hurl's ref ref reflections, whose books can then be subsumed under one question, namely, what is Anthropocene subjectivity? When geology in the form of metals and rare minerals, this is what Yusi Parika is talking a lot about, when, when, when geology in the form of metals and rare minerals is part of the computer I wrote this paper on, and when both the hardware and software partly structure my way of thinking, then I need to acknowledge geological and non-human aspects of my own agency, of course. Intentions of and free will are kind of put into question. We're living in times, as I guess uh, the tour would often have said, we live, we live in times of recomposition. Amelia Smith's text, uh, like Proust's novel, 100 years before, is also fictive in a sense, work it, like, woven into contemporaneity in effective intermedial ways. But whereas Proust hid his effective intermedial connectedness, Amelia Smith does not cover her media technological proceedings. She puts it in, in, in front of a novel, we could say. So Amelia Smith, born 1985, um, is trained both at the School of Creative Writing uh, in Denmark and at the Danish, and the Danish Academy for Fine Arts. Uh, and it seems logical that this book is called a hybrid for that reason. She's kind of a typical uh, double begabung. It's a hybrid. And the novel received praise and en enthusiastic reviews in Danish press. The hybrid elements are clear, first of all, because Smith mixes a basic media of uh, images and text on several pages. A more overarching hybrid of this novel, a more hybrid dimension, has to do with the entire structure of the book, as can be seen in the table of contents. You can't really see it, I have to explain it to you. So the table of contents divides the book into kind of two streams, you could say, or two parts. Uh, notes on the one side and then the txt dot at a point at the other. So the left pages of the entire book, if you read through it, uh, are personal, assumedly private reflections and worries and descriptions. Whereas in the txt point stream on the right hand pages of the entire book, is more of a theoretical and historical essayistic text. And it's no coincidence then that the, uh, that the TXT part of this begins with a reflection on, as you can see perhaps, on Penelope. Odysseus' wife, the cunning proto-feminist, perhaps, weaver Penelope. According to the book, weaving, weaving looms Weaving is the first technology, perhaps the first technology of mankind, Emily Smith seems to argue, a preparatory ground for the industrial revolution of weaving cloth. Weaving lies, for Emily Smith, behind contemporary digital structures, weaving together zeros and ones in hypercomplex patterns. And text, as any literary scholar would know, is etymologically connected to weaving and texture and cloth. So a literary and, no, sorry, a literal and allegorical meaning of weaving dominates the essay elements of the text. Smith uses then the medial affordances of the book medium to produce a two-stringed hybrid, which in itself works as a kind of philosophical and aesthetic statement. But eventually, when you try to read through and try to find a way to read the, you know, uh, either one stream or the two stream together, you find out that the dichotomic, dichotomic system she has set up is bound to break down. It is indeed the breakdown of the dichotomic system that produces the real intensities of the work. And we could say perhaps that uh, she breaks it down in three different ways. 
Um, first of all, she makes a very intricate and, and interesting way of uh, describing in detail uh, Penelope uh, so strategies for, you know, uh, taking up time, destroying and creating at the same time, which then leads her to one of the predecessors of uh, um, producing computers, Ada Lovelace, in, from the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, and then as a kind of identification with herself, she puts herself in the role of a contemporary either Penelope or Ada Lovelace. So Ada Lovelace was one of the co-inventors of early computers. Another way that she breaks down the dichotomy has to do with her way that she uh, literally builds her own computer as if it were a kind of loom. So she, she puts together different things to create, produce her own computer. And with this computer, she both writes, but also, she also produces algorithms to, pr to produce uh, grand weavings, grand uh, uh, gobelangs, you could say, which are possibly something that should be exhibited in, a, in an art exhibition. And that leads me then to the third part here, namely that what is even more in a kind of distracting when it comes to the kind of dichotomy between the two separate versions, the, the personal and the essayistic, is that it turns out that this book actually has a kind of uh, follow-up in, in a real exhibition in the real world in Denmark. So she made this uh, spectacular exhibition that I only saw, in, uh, unfortunately, in, in photos, but it looks beautiful, called exactly Looming. So initially I said that Smith's novel depicts contemporary Scandinavian Anthropocene life. And this Anthropocene then has less to do with the bioecological climate situation, even though it's, it's there also in the novel. It's more about a post-human, unnaturalized social condition, societal condition. Without explicitly stressing this, but demonstrating it via her form, uh, Smith's book depicts life after or beyond conventional subject-object, art, nature, human nature, dichotomies. So affective, affective intermediality is exemplarily present in Threadripper, I would say. Subjectivity today, today is produced in biological and technological and economic preconditions that Smith identifying with Penelope and Ada Lovelace, uh, she's partly subjected to that, to these conditions. But she can also make the conditions into the material of creative, inter, inter creative transmediations by using and by being used by the universal loom, or what she calls the hyperloom of this weave or computer or whatever we should which call it. The text performs its own, part, its own partly disintegration when it becomes clear that some kind of digital agency is actually maneuvering behind her back. It's writing her and it's writing the book that we are reading, supposedly. Oh, I had to get some water. So up until now, I have talked about um, rela relations between affectivity and intermediality as a theoretical combination that may help conceptualize subjectivity. It might be considered a kind of abstract speculative activity without bearings on other societal issues, but this is not the case. And I mentioned above that for Hansen and Hurl and Lübeck and many others, um, an, adequ an adequate and post-anthropocentric understanding of subjectivity is indeed the precondition for confronting the ecological emergency we find ourselves in. So in the final part of my presentation, a little more brief, I will discuss two examples of explicit climate uh, communication examples, you could say, where I make the simple argument that there is a risk in climate crisis communication of not succeeding if the most fundamental dimensions of effective intermediality is not taken into consideration. Namely, that subjectivity is immediately conditioned and per definition is entangled in non-human environments. 
So another image from uh, from the exhibition. So in this book, coming in January, uh, uh, that I have written with my colleague uh, Niklas Salmose, uh, we are trying to suggest a way to combine uh, questions uh, of uh, climate change communication in environmental humanities, try to attack some of the issues by way of intermedial studies. Um, in a sense, it's a relatively simple construction in, in, in the sense that we argue that we, it would be practical with a theory that can uh, both analyze and describe and then compare all the different mediations of the climate crisis that we're facing because is the kind of but, uh, fundamental argument, we only reach, we only get in, in touch with uh, climate change and the ecological crisis by way of all these different media. So we need tools to analyze it and compare it. So what we're doing is that we compare uh, like uh, 10 or 12 different uh, media types uh, in the book in different chapters uh, following different topics and there would be anything from clarifying literature to film to advertising campaigns and then to two of the examples I'm going to mention here relatively briefly uh, to exemplify a little bit. Namely first the IPCC, part of the, uh, the grand IPCC report of thousands of pages almost as big as Proust novel by the way which is then condensed into what is called the summary for policymakers, which is in the, the, the latest one, I think, is like a 35 pages. That's one I'm going to um, briefly talk about here. So I'm going to show you some images from that, uh, unless um, you may be familiar with it, have seen some of the... Um, uh, and I'm interested in, in, in the book, we are very interested in how truthfulness is produced in this text. I'm going to have a slightly other... Uh, approach here in my presentation. But we're seeing here that it's a uh, so it's a classical intermediate text in the sense that it mixes pure prose, which has its own, uh, it's, it's very interesting to, in, uh, to analyze actually the prose of this report. I'm not going to go into that here. Uh, so we have the prose and we have uh, these uh, very, in a sense, um, simplified but also very um, uh, complex uh, visual representations of different things. In this case, um, it is signs of human influence on the world, on the planetary condition that we see here. So I should say also there's a, there's a huge work of uh, climate change communication lying behind this report. There are very strict rules for all IPCC writers how to communicate things. So this is no coincidence, this is a kind of a, uh, ordered down into the last uh, smallest detail. Uh, we would have other uh, visualization of possible futures here. Uh, how can it go? What kind of scenarios do we have? We would have um, uh, kind of a planetary overview of uh, heating and uh, other stuff going on here. Um, sorry. <laughs> but what is lacking here, conspicuously lacking, strangely lacking, is any consideration of kind of uh, human beings in this. So uh, even though they actually talk about in the kind of uh, uh, programs concerning how to communicate this, they say very much uh, talk to people where they are, uh, don't forget to use pictures, uh, images from our picture bank and so on. This uh, summary for po policymakers is kind of totally cleansed of any human uh, involvement. So the IPCC report here, in a sense, is radical in its non-effective uh, intermediality. Latour and many others have clearly demonstrated how, as we know, science in many ways has to be understood as a transitions, translations between disciplines and life worlds and media. But we do not see any science of any of the scientific production of the supposedly truth material here. And I'm not, uh, of course, in any way criticizing the, uh, the kind of results as such. I'm interested in how they present the, re the results. The IPCC, I would say, has chosen an, an perhaps an efficient, I'm not sure, but perhaps also conspicuously purest model of science communication, namely an inhuman or non-human version, without any mentioning of humans or subjectivity or social 
issues. Um, we go much further into this uh, uh, in, in our book, but here uh, enough, in, enough said about that is it's a kind of, it's one way of trying to communicate the climate crisis without, we could say, any possibilities for human um, identification. Which is then oppositely the case in this um, um, big uh, graphic novel by Philippe Squassoni. Uh, this is the uh, American translation. The, the French version is called Saison Brune. And this has, a, in a sense, a better title, namely, it's called The Climate Changed a Personal Journey Through the Science. So the title already says that this is about climate change. The, which is uh, the planetary condition, which is climate changed, but is also very much, as a subtitle in, in the American book says, about the personal journey that leads him to be the subject being climate changed. And I'm, uh, I, so it's not a perfect graphic novel. There um, would be uh, aesthetic issues, other issues, but I'm interested in this, and Nicholas and I were interested in this because it seems to, Instead of uh, stressing the impersonal nature of uh, producing scientific truthfulness, it stresses the personal entrance into the scientific uh, results and being climate change then. And I'm going to show you a few images from the, from the book here. So it's very French in a sense, right? Here we have the, the, in, in a, a brooding, a brooding, if it's because we're only thinking about how, what to do with all the knowledge he's taking in. I'm a little bit ironic, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's in, in a sense, very classical. I should say also, it's a kind, it's a, I think it's 450 pages. It's a huge book, a huge amount of uh, scientific uh, stuff in it, you could say, but also uh, many, many, many personal existential reflections on what to do with your life, uh, get kids, uh, travel to Tokyo, uh, because it's flattering, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's all about personalizing the climate change science, and that that can be kind of visualized then in a in an image like this, where we see, of course, some of the famous uh, hockey stick graphs, right? Here, and you would see other uh, elements of uh, science in the way being produced. And at the same time, we have some of these quotes having to do with what this is all about. And then kind of, it's hard to say what is superposed on what here, superimposed on what here. But this is a kind of image of how he is being climate changed by, by science, reading science, by doing research. And then in the final spread, and this actually is a, it's a little bit of a, I'm not quite sure if it is um, explicitly referring to Marcel Proust. Marcel Proust is famous for, fame, the, the Marcel Proust uh, book is famous for having a hard time getting to start. It's like it begins and then it doesn't begin and then begins and begins. And that's, so the very first images in the book of Philip Squassoni asks explicitly how to begin a book. And he quotes literature, not Proust about literature and film and everything else. And he asks, how can I begin a book with such an immense um, uh, hyper-object theme of uh, climate change? And then it rolls and then it then ends on this kind of self-reflective uh, ending once again. So it's, it's a kind of a, a Proustian version of how to be climate changed, we could say. So, I'm very close to the end now. Human beings live in mediated relations to the world and other people. Media that I would normally define as material communicative entities in art, business, politics, and science gives us entry to the world and access to other human beings' inner and outer worlds. This, I think, is a starting point in the task for media studies and intermedial studies. It's at the same time quite simple and overwhelmingly complex. But this task does not, does not exist outside or beyond history. A main difference from Proust to Smith to Smith and Squassoni is of course historical. Media and technologies were as important for Proust as it would be for Amelia Smith, but it's a different media constellation. In the not so new millennium, 
The effects of digi digitalization have accelerated to the extent that it has transformed almost every aspect of life, practically everywhere on the planet. Social, cultural, material, and medial infrastructures have been rapidly changed due to technological development. And one of the results of this is that hybrid and mixed medial communication, what many of us roughly would cover with the term intermediality, it has become more and more ubiquitous. And I argue then that literature and the arts are privileged areas for diagnosing this. And this, uh, we have, I've seen this in many presentations here also, of course. It has been a useful strategy, I think, in intermediate studies to see media as heterogeneous forms of communicative types, from IPCC reports uh, to uh, novels to films to uh, theater performances in technical media of display like audio books or mobile phones or simply books. The question I have tried to raise today is how an intermediate theory of subjectivity could look like. What are the effects of the ubiquity of techno intermediate infrastructures at Proust's time, before Proust and today? Effective intermediality has worked as a possibility for me opposing this sort of questions, pointing for me in the direction of a kind of anthropocentric, of a less anthropocentric understanding of human subjectivity. And here I wanted to end uh, with a quote, almost end at least, with a quote by Derek Woods in an article uh, called Scale Critique that I was being made aware of just recently by two Swedish colleagues where Derek Wood says, says that the subject of the Anthropocene is not the human species, but modern terraforming assemblages. What is necessary is a horizontal assemblage theory of the relations among humans, non-human species, and techniques, rather than a vertical phylogenetic account that traces all causal chains back to the embodied intelligence of Homo sapiens. So it's much for him about working in different scales, which has become necessary. In metaphorical terms, I wish to see intermediality, effective intermediality, not as something lying in front of an agent who can choose from a set of options or tools. I want to move towards a view where media and mediation and individual subjectivity are effectively embedded into each other. Thank you. wondering, you mentioned the, the idea of scale. I was wondering, I have a question about the time scale of global geological change. We usually think of geological eras in terms of something inaccessible to the mind for the millions yes. of years, while the Anthropocene has rendered the notion of an era much more closer mm. as in, in, in human terms, yes. but still one of the reasons the research in, on policy making has shown that uh, thinking about policies to counter global warming, climate change, uh, go against the idea that policymakers can only think in terms of what will happen in three, four, five, six, maybe ten years if you really make an effort. Mm. But mm. it's difficult mm. to think of mm. what will happen in a generation yeah. or two generations. Yeah. I was wondering if in your research, you have tackled the idea of how your approach inter intercritical intermediality could help us grasp this time, the, the, the massive dimension of time scale that is involved in this. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, it, it it is a it was a very strange moment when it, when uh, suddenly the Anthropocene become a very popular term because normally we we wouldn't you know be very inspired by geology and the humanities for instance and then suddenly everybody took this uh, term uh, a little bit by coincidence perhaps or a little bit because uh, it relatively quickly become became clear as I said that this the term in a sense has a potential. Uh, philosophically, epistemologically, uh, to kind of turn things around. We thought that um, cultural history and natural history was totally divided, and then suddenly they uh, become the same thing, possibly. 
and uh, it I think so I think the Anthropocene um, as a kind of quasi uh, geological concept has worked and that I try to say it very briefly here that it has worked as a kind of you know um, um, gathering term for all the different kind of uh, climate ecological crises that we're actually in. It has also been uh, criticized immensely be, because you know it, it, it seems to say that it is mankind that has produced the situation we're in, uh, which it is not. It is you know particular groups, smaller groups in certain areas of the world in a relatively short period of time actually who has produced the situation we're in. So it's been so that's why people are talking about the capitalocene or the plantation scene, all this, all this stuff. Um, so I think perhaps uh, when it comes to um, the temporal aspects, um, I'm not quite sure if that's going to be the real uh, battleground concerning, you know, because I mean, um, what the Anthropocene geologically says is that it is very uh, unprecedented that things are changing so quickly that we have to invent a new uh, epoch for it, even and that that's, that that it, don't, it doesn't really matter if we're talking about the Anthropocene beginning after World War Two, or you know in eighteen uh, hundreds, or even you know when uh, uh, when uh, Columbus uh, went to uh, to uh, Americas, it doesn't matter because it, it's a time idea of this. I think that's that uh, that uh, kind of uh, insight will wane. Uh, people is not going to be. Uh, kind of moved by that so much. I think the next battle is going to be the eco-justice uh, question, namely who produced this, how are we going to solve this? And this, it's already what's happening then in the UN and uh, in our national parliaments, uh, I suppose everywhere, right? Where one of the reasons why it's so hard for politicians to, to get beyond the three, five, eight years borders of uh, influence is that it's going to cost something for some people, and they're not willing to make a kind of real uh, eco-justice solution on that. Um, but that's more the political. I I, I made I made a, I wrote an article some years ago, um, already some years ago, on concerning um, uh, mediations of the temporal aspects of the Anthropocene. That was not so much comparing as it was describing, namely the kind of how how do we understand these immense things, and we uh, it's very hard for us to uh, I can conclude right. It's beyond our human perception to a certain extent. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm just curious about your thoughts potentially on um, the affective possibilities of climate non-fiction film. Um, so films that are dealing with, we're obviously familiar with sci-fi as a, as a genre, as a speculative fiction genre, mm. but climate non-fiction films, and I'm thinking of, I haven't yet had an opportunity to see it, but How to Blow Up a Pipeline, which has just um, yeah. started its festival run, and, and seemingly um, is really um, creating a groundswell of mm. ideas and thoughts and, and affect it discourses. Mm. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on the possibilities of that as an affective realm. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So I, I've written a little bit about some um, some uh, non-fiction uh, climate films like um, Ice. Uh, what's it called again? Uh, um, I'm also getting a little bit tired. I'm not as tired as you are, I'm sure, but. Uh, uh, and it's come to me in a moment, but it's a kind of a film about a, a scientific endeavors concerning to pick up the ice cores uh, in in uh, in uh, in the deep ice to to consider the kind of you know evidence for uh, the climate change we're in, and um, and even now I don't remember the other film either. <laughs> uh, um, but so the, it was two films that were non-fictional. And where one of them uh, was actually applying a kind of a Hollywood, Hollywood style, you know, the hero, he was so tired, he even broke his leg, but he went out to, s to put up the cameras and he succeeded in, in demonstrating how ice, uh, ice, uh, the icebergs uh, are carving. 
uh, it was an interesting film and good, I mean, but it seems to fall in a little bit to the, into the traps of, uh, you know, Hollywood uh, schemes. Whereas the other one was actually more, um, uh, more uh, based on, you know, the collective ways of gathering novel, n knowledge and uh, producing knowledge about the... So the, the one would be Hollywood, the, the other would be Latour, in a sense. And I think they, these, thing, these films could be... Uh, I'm sure they are valuable. Um, the the thing about um, all the things we discuss in our book, and when you mention nonfiction, climate stuff, and uh, anything else, is of course that we are not. We have a little bit of ideas concerning uh, what the uh, real impact of these things uh, really are. Um, so there's a field now developing called empirical ecocriticism. Uh, which is really interesting because they do um, they do res um, reception studies on people being exposed to some of these things. They would be exposed to uh, literature dealing with uh, animal suffering or uh, other things, climate change uh, material, and then they would really see uh, what uh, what happens to us when we read or see things. As I as I understand the um, the research. Uh, they, uh, I'm happy to say that we are influenced by reading uh, s uh, material on this or seeing things, but uh, often it's relatively short-term. That's a bad side of this. So, uh, you know, they make these experiments where they ask us to donate to different things without knowing that we're actually in an experiment. And it, it's clear that we get, uh, we are, we get influenced, we get uh, affected, so to speak, by... Um, both uh, fictive and non-fictive non material. I think the most interesting, uh, in a sense, uh, results of that research is that they seem to say that uh, what is actually, it's, it's a very, um, sup um, yeah, not superficial exactly, but um, artificial way of um, trying to demonstrate that. Because I wouldn't, you know, normally read one clarify novel and then not think about climate change after that, right? So what they're talking about, and which is something that is more or less impossible to investigate, is that we're, of course, living in kind of ecologies of impressions, right? So I would read, I would perhaps see the new film, uh, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, but I would also read newspaper articles confirming me in my bias, so to speak, and I would get, get confirmed, I would collect my knowledge into this and get more and more uh, supposedly convinced perhaps also pacified, perhaps also feeling, feeling that nothing's happening. So perhaps what arts could do, and arts also being non fictive of course, is perhaps to give other perspectives than what, let's say, the, uh, the IPCC report does. And that's perhaps a hopeful thing that art has a possibility for making, giving new, uh, surprising, um, sometimes even some kind of hopeful perspectives so that we feel that it's worthwhile to, to do something. Thank you. Any more questions? Is there somebody? Okay, let's see that. Hydron, uh, could you ask the question, then unmute your microphone. Yes. So thank you, first of all, uh, Jürgen. It was fantastic how you combined theory and literature and come starting from Proust and coming and ending with Proust. It was like uh, drinking champagne with <laughs> you, so fantastic. But I want to focus on two things in from your talk, uh, two terms or... Uh, concepts the one is technology you used in the beginning mm -hmm. and the other is actually the idea about objectivity versus subjectivity in the second part of your talk that you brought up because i thought it was very interesting how you came with these non-tech from the non-technologically interested literary proust to technology and then using the the, the danish author in order to speak about that actually weaving is the first technology, human technology, not printing as we are usually doing. 
coming with a background of techne instead of technology. And this is the part that really needs to be considered when we are coming to affect, affecting and subjectivity and objectivity. Because when you are speaking, spoke about this big report and asked after human beings and the human is out, out there, then you brought up the form of um, comic very nicely, I think, uh, where, where you have this super imposition of um, human being and graphics or indexical graphics. That brings us to the idea that how do we consider Anthropocene or climate change according to what system? And there we have the system, if you remember Deleuze saying, my philosophy is always a system, and he uses an organic system, for, starting from the monad, in opposite to Badieu, who trace, to, to, to takes it math, um, mathematically, and all things taking it abstractly, going back to, to numbers and things like that. So where, when you are saying, on the one hand, art has an alternative view on things, whatever art might mean now. Uh, and then on the other hand, where is the subjectivity? And then you want to have affective, the affectivity in intermediate um, relationships less subjective. Where you actually pointed at with Latour that no science can be objective. It's always related to subjects. So I think you are going into a direction there where I want to ask you, where is subjectivity, where is objectivity mm. place, and where? how do you bring this into arts or the intermediate study of arts? Oh, I don't, that was a difficult question. We need champagne, right? Yes, <laughs> now. Uh, but um, yeah, S mm, I, I don't think I can answer it really, but I, but I think I have gone into some kind of uh, Laturian mode where I would say, uh, um, I, I suppose perhaps the, a little bit the later Latour when he, uh, when he had stopped fooling around and just teasing uh, to say that everything is uh, uh, relativist and subjectivistic, then uh, of course in his later work, um, when he got convinced, you know, about um, the, the necessity of uh, some kind of, yeah, uh, scientific work that is uh, sufficiently strong to convince us to change politically. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going in that direction where all, um, all objectivity has both to be convincing actually for us to receive it, but also as a kind of a, a procedure is going through lots of subjective, and I would then also say, yeah, translations, right, as uh, tr me, uh, Latour talks about. So I'm, all the media translations that takes place from, so from, how should we say it, something out there, right? Uh, being, in a sense, gradually, uh, step by step, first by being collected in some way, and then being put on, down into writing, then put uh, into a, collected several uh, data, then put into a scientific article, then slowly getting in all the way to an IPCC report. These are media transformations actually that in a sense then ends up being uh, authoritative uh, evidence for uh, where we are scientifically. And where, so I, I'm just evade, I'm just trying to uh, avoid to answer your question, but I, so I'm trying to say perhaps that, I'm trying to ask you perhaps, where would uh, subjectivity begin and uh, objectivity end there or the other? I mean, where, because, and this is a big discussion. I, I cut out a little phrase uh, here concerning um, a discussion that Andreas Malm, the guy who wrote the book, uh, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, he wrote the kind of uh, uh, that book, and he made another book called The Progress of the Storm, which is one, you know, 200 pages where he just, totally uh, aggressively, in a sense, uh, uh, goes down on uh, uh, to criticize Haraway and Latour in particular. Everybody else who talks about hybridity, uh, new materialism, all the things I'm kind of talking about here because he's, he considered to be uh, untrue, first of all, and also strategically stupid. 
it's just going to you know, make us uh, discuss things like this instead of going out and do things. I think <laughs> then the opposite. I think, as I tried to say, and that's there here, just kind of uh, repeat what uh, Lübecker and uh, Hansen and Hurl says. I would say that we need a sophisticated way of understanding what is human agency, uh, human intentions, uh, political agency, uh, to try to better understand and act in the situation. That would be my response. But I'm, I, I can't answer really uh, the the subject. But uh, but I can say at least, uh, Heidron, that um, for me at least, I'm trying to think about this, and it's getting very, very clear to me, of course, that, uh, so to speak, traditional understandings of the subject or subjectivity doesn't, uh, doesn't work anymore. And it hasn't done that for a long time. I'm getting pretty, pretty late to this insight. But now I'm trying to understand it. And the same goes for technology, actually. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so I would probably, if I, I, I would actually um, more and more do like uh, I see that um, once again, uh, uh, Hurl and Hansen and Lübecker, in a sense, uh, put par many, many parallels between technology and media. I would have a very mm -hmm. hard time once again saying where does one stop and where does the other begin. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very. I think it's interesting and fruitful to to think like that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. I see a raised hand uh, uh, in the box uh, uh, signed Ellen Pimple. Yes. Hello. Um, thank you very much for this wonderful keynote speech. I have two points that I would like to discuss uh, with you and uh, the rest of the people there and everybody online. Uh, first is a bit political, okay, and my question is how do we manage not to make eco-justice charity? To make it what? So Sorry, I, did, I didn't hear the last word. To make, to make eco-justice charity, yeah? So my, uh -huh. my question yes. is, a, this is a bit philosophical and a bit political. I, I, I would like to learn, you know, just your view or everybody else's view on this. If eco-justice flirts with charity and how we go beyond that, yes, as a notion. Okay. Uh, so that's my point number one. I'd and like to be, let's, let's let, I'd, I'd try to yeah, answer yeah, now, yeah, otherwise yeah. I forget. Uh, so yeah, I yeah. think, so... Um, wouldn't it be a good idea to avoid the charity question uh, to historicize it instead of you know having a feeling that now now we are going to to pay to the poor for for our sins or something i guess that's what you mean with charity i think yes, probably so, yeah, so probably I, to, I to yeah so probably to, yeah, yeah. to to avoid that we probably have to uh uh, do some kind of uh, really, really uh, tiring and uh, long and um, um, difficult work of historicizing the situation we're in. And here, that, that was a little bit of, of my answer to you also. It's not going to be very useful to talk about the Anthropocene going down to geology and so on. Uh, it should be other concepts like uh, colonialism and capitalism that would uh, be useful here, I think, to make it uh, clear that this is not, it is exactly not charity, but justice we're talking about. It's, it sounds very easy, but it's not going to be very easy. Yes. I think. Yes, what do you I think? I, I agree. I, I think it's one of the most difficult things. Uh, my, my other point is that I get a sense that affect is connected a lot to embodiment, to the notion of embodiment. Uh, however, all this eco criticism and um, the Anthropocene and post-humanism, if you want, and uh, climate change, they bring in our imagination um, images of uh, uh, the human race having been extinguished or, uh, you know, a very problematic, sporadic presence here and there, a bit of a flaneur remake uh, in a deserted uh, dystopian uh, environment or something like that. So my, my question is, um, if affect is anchored in embodiment and eco-criticism 
may actually picture a future with a human absence or a problematic human presence. Do you think there's lots of work to be done there or do you see um, them combined immediately? Mm. That was also a little bit of a difficult uh, question. <laughs> you have inspired us, that's why. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, what I mean, um, so so I guess I'm, uh, I'm uh, I guess what I'm saying is that um, parts of what has to be done probably to make it uh, to make the science understandable and perhaps also make let's say the question of eco justice um, yeah also understandable and something we we some kind of vague we here feel that we need to act upon, it, it probably needs some kind of, uh, uh, we need arts and uh, science and politics needs to offer uh, ways of identification, I think. And that's what, I, okay. that's, but that's what I'm saying that the, uh, and that could be a kind of strange identifications, one-to-one -one identifications. What, what, would, what, what, would, what would, you know, my middle-class life be like if temperatures are rising five degrees? That's a lot of cli-fi doing that sort of things. But that could, we could imagine all uh, sorts of uh, versions of uh, thinking about how things could be, but also, you know, uh, there are, there are uh, really, really interesting um, I would say post-humanist, uh, uh, for instance, fantasy, uh, fantasy versions of uh, of post-human uh, utopian worlds, <laughs> as a, a, a time after the climate disaster, where we can actually nevertheless live in new forms. And these, some, I'm thinking about, uh, for instance, um, uh, I think a fantastic book by uh, uh, Litna Yuknovic. Uh, the Book of Joan, which came out five, eight years ago, which is a fantastic uh, gender-bending, uh, queer, dark uh, version of uh, Joan of Arc, a kind of, uh, kind of uh, uh, the late Middle Ages turned into a far, far future where there's hardly any genitals anymore on people and there's uh, hardly any uh, natural uh, erotics anymore, but there's lots of power struggles and uh, possibilities of living other lives. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's, there's plenty of room for um, imagination. So, yes, so, 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 in other words, and, and just to remind you, as you know, you know, Donna Haraway or Roshi Bradotti, uh, in, a, in, a, in many ways, celebrates the possibility of a post-human understanding which is much less, uh, you know, uh, patriarchal or capitalistic and so on. So I, I see many uh, attempts to uh, offer, yeah, utopian post-human versions of the world. Yes, I think you mentioned the identification and this uh, requires empathy and analogy. So um, I completely agree with you, yes, on this. So, uh, uh, and a question from Dr. Mauro Lili. Uh, just a reflection as we finally end with intermediality and Anthropocene. Is there a tragic flaw within the knowledge systems finally to be alienated from the affective processes of the organicity of life and whether the ghost lies in the power of Homo sapiens in the supposedly triumphant act of representation? <laughs> That was beautiful. <laughs> so I would probably, um, if I even understand you, it's a, it's a very beautiful, evocative question. Um, well, I would probably say let's not make it, uh, you know, tragic in the sense that it's kind of our fate, you know, this feeling that mankind, because we're like this and like that, let's... Uh, Historicize it. Let's understand what, what, where did we took some, 
turns that we should have thought uh, more about, so to speak, and how can we correct it, how can we repair. I was in Berlin on my way down here uh, to, uh, to Cluj, and I saw a great uh, exhibition at the um, Akademie der Künste in Berlin, uh, the architect, a kind of architect, uh, Anthropocene, you could say, exhibition, which was called um, something with repair. The, the theme was repair. And I think that's, that would, I'm um, quite inspired by, they had two really, really interesting uh, exhibition catalogs and, and, and for this show. And they talked a lot about uh, get into the mode of repair. So I, so, and that's a kind of, you know, a minor, um, I, I, I don't know if I get, I get the vibes of a little bit of, you know, the grand feelings of the tragic flaw and the ghost and all that. Let's go, I would probably go into the repair mode. Let's try to, not in a techno optimistic things of uh, technology will fix it, more like let's uh, try to fix the small things now in our also kind of a, a political uh, investment. But But I'm not. I'm not sure if I uh, if I answered your your question. Okay, thank you. Anyway, uh, anybody uh, from the room, if uh, you want to ask a question, or if we should uh, conclude here, uh, then thank you uh, once more, Jürgen, you. for your thank you. Thank you.